Lives are changed at Alliance Health Project. Our lives and the lives of our clients. Whether you come for HIV services, sexual health, mental health, substance use, or gender care, you leave here a little stronger, a little more known and seen. And that is healing. Why do people come to AHP? They know we are committed to the highest standard of care, with a heightened sense for race, gender, and sexuality. How that interplay affects our clients, affects all of us. They come because they connect with our staff, who treat them with respect, dignity, and compassion. And that is healing. Alliance Health Project, making the world a better place one person at a time. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Welcome to Art for AIDS 2020. It ha it's happening. I wanna thank you all, all the artists we have over 200 pieces of art in this auction and in these crazy times that says volumes about the generosity of artists who, you know, while losing their shows, their studios, their livelihoods are still so committed to philanthropy and it's extraordinary. So thank you. Thank you so much. And to the jurors who had to figure out how to evaluate art um, session after session, week after week, for hours on end, we looked at art and you have created an incredible show. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the art, um, you can think about the artist and the jurors as you do that, because it was a very collaborative process. Also, I want to thank the sponsors. You know, during this time of incredible economic insecurity, people are still sponsoring Art for AIDS and sponsoring the work that is done at the Alliance Health Project. And we've raised uh, almost $100,000 already in sponsorships. And um, that's, that's pretty extraordinary, especially in these really trying times. And finally, the bidders and the buyers who've already been super active, you've been um, carrying away out there on that auction site and that is pretty cool to watch. So thank you so much. And officially, it doesn't even open until this moment. So uh, we've had, we did some early um, bidding um, for folks who um, had sponsored. So we're, um, we're seeing some of those bids. Sorry, I just um, went to pull up my notes and I stalled a little. Uh, you know, our phrase 2020, boy, we, uh, we did a lot of what we asked our clients to do, which was to pivot, to trust the process, to put one foot in front of the other, even if we couldn't see the end and we often could not see the end and just keep moving one day at a time. And, it's, it's been a journey and we're here. And so um, welcome 2020 Art for AIDS. This is our kickoff. Um, a little bit about tonight's program. We're gonna start, each juror is going to um, introduce the artists. The artists are gonna talk for a little while. We're gonna listen to four artists give presentations. And then we're gonna go into a panel session and um, the jurors are gonna, it's going to be more conversational where the jurors will ask the artist questions and you too can participate by using the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and ask us questions. They'll go through Jonathan, who's here um, and who has done so much to make this possible, um, but he's behind the firewall and um, also security. People cannot bomb this because it is a webinar, so you're safe, but we would like your questions and like your participation. So. Art for AIDS is now open, and I'm going to start by handing it over to our juror, Robert Melton, who you probably all know from holding the live auction pieces, but he has a big role behind the scenes as well. So off to you, Robert.
Robert, you're muted. Okay, Noel. Mongan. Carrie Ann Plank and Michelle Mongan. Amazing artist tonight. I'll start with Carrie Ann Plank. Carrie Ann Plank is a San Francisco based artist working in the mediums of insulation, printmaking, painting, and glass. Her printmaking process examines the intersecting patterns to describe new structures utilizing mathematical equations. Her works are included in museums, public and private, and corporate collections. Our next artist is Michelle Mungen. She's a San Francisco-based artist as well. Her works include drawings and paintings and printmaking. Michelle studied in printmaking in Cuba. Her works have been shown in many galleries and exhibitions in San Francisco as well as Cuba. Thank you, artist. Hi, hello. Um, thank you all for joining us and supporting Art for AIDS. And, and thank you, Robert, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I'm Carrie Ann Plank again. Uh, I'm a San Francisco based artist coming to you from my studio. Um, I'm represented by Themes and Projects Gallery in the Minnesota Street Project and by Bryant Street Galleries in Palo Alto. You can find my work in lots of um, Public collections, um, some notable examples are the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the Library of Congress, and corporate collections like Google and Genentech. Um, I utilize a lot of uh, printmaking techniques in my work, um, although um, I'm a bit of a more non-traditional printmaker. So you can find my works um, under the mixed media section. Um, but because I have such a love for print, uh, I'm in the prints and drawings talk. So um, thank you for guys for having me. Uh, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the piece that I donated for Art for AIDS this year. And it's part of my deconstructed gift series. And um, a lot of my work really deals with um, visualizations of information systems. I use a lot of like charting and graphing and math in the work that I create. And in this particular instance, I was really looking at reducing, um, you know, a kind of base shape into a gridded structure and looking what happens to that structure when, when force is applied upon it. And what's really fun about the piece is if you kind of lay them all out, you can actually see that movement and transition in, in a bit of a stop motion animation. So I think it's a really really, really fun piece. Um, I, a lot of my work um, involves a lot of color, um, but for this series, I was really focusing on the very kind of graphic black and white. And, you know, they are actually graphics. Um, the, the technique I'm utilizing is uh, woodcut. What I'm doing is I'm taking wood blocks, carving kind of below the surface to kind of change that surface and then rolling it up with ink. And then under pressure, the, the image, you know, is released onto the substrate. And these are on panels that kind of project off of the wall. I think, um, you know, I like them to be these kind of unique one of a kind art objects. Uh, a lot of printmaking techniques are um, utilized in addition making process, but I'm less focused on that. I really am more interested in that special mark that only comes from printmaking. Um, and that was probably two minutes. <laughs> um, so thank you all for joining me. Please uh, bid up and support the Alliance Health Project. Thank you, Carrie Ann Plank. Now we have Michelle Mungan. Hello. Um, thank you, Robert, and thank everyone at Art Parades, the artists and jurors. I'm very excited and honored to be here participating in my third Art for AIDS. I am a figurative artist and I am inspired by the human body. My work will typically begin with a figure drawing using live studio models. And from there for printmaking and painting purposes, I will often refer back to those figure drawings and reinvent, reimagine, and reposition the figures into new contexts, settings, and meanings. Uh, my favorite kinds of printmaking are monotypes, which are a painterly type of printmaking, collagraphs, which is a more um, collaged form of printmaking, and uh, woodcuts. And over the past several years, I've worked on several different woodcut series involving manually carving into wooden puzzles. Um, and then from there, I will arrange or rearrange the puzzle pieces on the press bed when creating the images. The common theme and focus of this work 
has been connection, connection, disconnection, reconnection, interconnection. And I feel as though during these past seven months, this theme of connection has been intensely present in all of our lives as everything is interconnected. Again, thank you to everyone at Art for AIDS and the Alliance Health Project, all of the jurors and our panel hosts tonight, Robert and Nico, um, all of the artists and everyone bidding and buying art at this year's Art for AIDS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm here to, uh, my name is Nico van Dongen, I'm a juror. I'm here to introduce the next two artists, um, Simona Burnageva and uh, David Avery. Uh, Simona is uh, a graphic artist as well as an illustrator, gets her inspiration uh, from nature, uh, predominantly uh, works in the series in black and white. And David Avery, um, is uh, an etching and dry point um, fine artist. Um, he has he has some beautiful uh, work tonight. So uh, Simona, the word is for you. The word is to you. Hi guys, uh, thank you so much for having me over. It's a huge honor, and I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to donate this work to raise money in the fight for AIDS. Um, I, yes, I'm a graphic artist and illustrator. I was born in Bulgaria in a half Ukrainian, half Bulgarian family. But since I have lived and been educated um, all around the world, namely in Barcelona, uh, New York, London, and as of three years, almost exactly, I've been living in San Francisco. Um, my work uh, is, um, my background is a lot about kind of like design going towards uh, the fine arts. Um, um, I have done a lot of projects like illustration for children's and adults books, as well as um, projects for advertising, for packaging design, but also a lot of personal projects and explorations like this one piece here. Um, this piece named Harold too is very special to me because I did it in a point of my life when I was exploring drawing with a lot of color, a lot of watercolor, especially. And um, this is this is this series. So this piece is a, is a part of three series where I started to explore more about going more towards black and white and um, taking away rather than adding to my work. Um, so this piece marked the start of getting into really into texture and patterns and um, and like thinking how less of something can mean so much more. So yes, thank you guys for putting this event together tonight. I'm very excited and um, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Simona. Less is more, and more is better. Uh, <laughs> our next uh, final artist is David Avery. David, are you there? Uh well, hi. Uh, yeah, I want to thank everybody for Art for AIDS for including me on this illustrious panel and thank everyone who tuned in. Um, I'm often finding material and ideas in the work of the master engravers and etchers of the past 400 years. Uh, ideas that reflect in interesting ways on our current predicaments. Uh, the etching that is included in this year's auction on court is part of a loosely connected group of prints uh, inspired by Della Bella's striking uh, series of etchings called The Five Deaths from the 17th century. Uh, these works deal tangibly with the reality of death in everyday life, something our current viewpoint seems to preclude. So uh, the mass extinction event occurring before our very eyes is the theme I was involved with in this work. And I attempted to treat it with the black humor appropriate mm -hmm. to the subject, but I guess I usually do that anyway. Uh, extinction due to our continued and seemingly uh, enthusiastic embracing of uh, destructive environmental practices, uh, fossil fuel use, climate denial. For what? In order to make a buck? And as an embodiment of death, what could be more final than extinction? where regeneration is no longer possible. Uh, so all aboard, who will be next on the Extinction Express? Uh, 
Encore was completed as we were just beginning our sheltering mode. And as I was finishing up, uh, the thought struck me about the interconnectedness of all of these things, uh, uh, sea level rise, uh, mass extinction, uh, uh, firestorms, uh, hurricanes, and now pandemics. If we want to avoid being the next passengers on the Extinction Express, I think we need to embrace that part of humanity that can see the situation clearly and will allow us to aspire to do something about it. So thank you again, everybody involved, and uh, bid off and a bid high. Thank you all for that little uh, primer. And um, it's just so exciting to hear you talk about your work. It's, a, it's something that, it's one of the silver linings, isn't it? Um, that we, we didn't really get this chance when we were uh, in person. I guess, so now we're gonna transition to panel mode and the jurors are gonna ask the artist some questions. And um, so we'll start that now. Great. Before we get to the panel discussions, I'd like to check in with the artists about COVID, regarding COVID-19. How are you as an artist navigating through COVID? This is an open question. And how has COVID affected you in terms of your artistic inspiration and artistic processes? Carrie Ann, you want to go first on that? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I in some ways I've been lucky that I, you know, I have a private studio and I can still come out and work and be um, distanced from other people. So, you know, in that portion of my day to day life, um, you know, has has I've been able to continue, which is which has been great. Um, you know, when I think about how COVID is kind of coming out in the work, like what we're going through, how you're seeing it. Right. You know, I think that a lot of the new work I'm, I've been using um, has really, well, I've actually kind of been approaching things in a more kind of subtractive way. I find myself painting out areas and, and deleting areas as a way of making imagery, which, you know, I work fairly abstractly. So, at, you know, seeing that come up so much in the work, and I'm, I'm realizing a lot now that it, it has a lot to do with that subtraction that we're getting from all of our everyday lives. Right, right. Thank you. Simona? I have to say, I'm normally a pretty optimistic and happy and positive person. So I thought that I was going to be immune and especially, you know, working from home, I was already used to that. But I have to say there was a time in April and in May where I was, you know, down, I couldn't sleep well, you know, I was waking up in the middle of the night, stressed out about the ending of the world. And, uh, and my, my inspiration definitely took a hit and I was feeling very you know, um, scared, and I was really mean to myself. And, uh, but then as so many other artists stood up and said that they were having, you know, they were struggling, and they were too stressed out to work, and um, mostly women, surprisingly. Um, and that made me feel better, and I gave it time. And, um, and now it's all back. I'm super hungry and inspired, and I can't stop drawing. So it's all good. Great. Thank you. David. Well, yeah, uh, uh, I also have a studio in my own house. And initially it was like, well, great. I have all this time. Um, I don't need to go out. Uh, I can produce work. Uh, but I think there is something hoovering in the back and it, there's a weight there. And after a while, it, it kind of gets to you without you realizing it. And uh, I think the important thing is to acknowledge that we are going through this historical thing. And it's, uh, and it's certainly impacted my work. Uh, and I think, you know, also perhaps uh, combining that with uh, Trump PTSD is <laughs> very difficult to get through sometimes. <laughs> All right, thank you, David. Michelle? For me, um, in order to make art, I need to feel fearless, bold, uninhibited. And during the first several months of the pandemic, um, I was completely incapable of, of making any art in spite of the fact that I too have, I'm very lucky to have a private studio out at the Hunters Point shipyard. I was afraid to even go there. Um, and so I sheltered in place and, and tried to regain some, some kind of, um, some kind of internal control 
to recapture that that ability to open up and be be fearless again. And what I did basically was to clear out, clean out my garage and came across old house paint and some antique <laughs> wooden shelves that were down there. I dragged it all upstairs onto my dining room table and started painting at home. And it felt like once I worked through that, um, I worked through that that fear and that block, and I'm very thankful to have my studio and to be back out there um, making art again. And I have been very blessed and fortunate in that my health is good, and you know I'm very lucky that I have um, all the resources um, here that I could ever need. And so, great. Well, I want to thank all the artists for checking in especially during these uncertain times, you know, we all have to check on each other, you know, and I'm glad you guys are all healthy. Thank you. We do have a question for, uh, from the Q&A. Somebody has asked, Sandrine, actually, um, our designer who's responsible for all the look and feel. Sorry, I called you out, Sandrine. Um, uh, Simona, do you, can you talk about the process for hair? Um, sure. So hair was never meant to be a, you know, a piece that was going to be ever framed and donated for a fundraiser. It was just like, it was just like one of those inspirations that you do, and uh, sorry, explorations that you do where you're just like, hmm, I wonder what this is going to look like when I try this. And I wonder, um, you know, if I start, like, should I add a little bit more? Like, should I draw the whole hair? It was just like, it was pretty much a sketch that became a full, full blown drawing. Um, but so it's hair too is the second one. The hair one comes first. Um, there, 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 there's three hairs in total. Uh, with hair one, um, it was with ink, it had more detail. So hair two, I started to take out more. And with hair two, I learned that when I draw something like hair, uh, it's sometimes it's like very easy to think, oh, you just draw lines and you know, that's it. That's what hair looks like. But uh, it was that piece that tells me that when you draw singular of something you have to draw every single detail of that thing you have to pay equal amount of attention to it for it to look good and convincing and then it makes sense and then it looks good together um so with with that piece i learned that i had to take specific attention with every single hairline and hair trying to make sure that it looked good even though it's like one in like so many hairs everyone had to be good i don't know does that answer the question <laughs> Nico, you're muted. I don't know if you mean to be muted. Uh-oh. I'm muted. I have a question <laughs> for, um, for the artists. Um, art and artists, um, it's very alone. Uh, not to call it lonely. You are, you are with yourself, with, your, with all your emotions, whether you draw a hair or whether you engrave something. And what I would like maybe to, um, to hear you talk about is we're now we're all dealing with, with being alone and being with ourselves. And when you're an artist and you are fully immersed in your work, how do you deal with being with yourself? Because sometimes that can be uh, confrontational. And, but since we all have to deal with ourselves to a certain extent, maybe there is some wisdom that the artist can share. Um, <laughs> about being alone and with your tools? I think uh, when you are alone and you're working on your art, if you are truly clicking, you are somewhere else. And uh, it's not being alone. You're just totally involved in what you're doing. Uh, even if you're frustrated or irritated, uh, you lose yourself in a way and uh, you know, I, I was thinking about that because of the idea that, well, I could be alone in my studio, kind of like usual. I don't go out that much. Okay. Um, but the artist does, it, if, what's it, if it's not about communication, what is it about? And if you're not communicating with anybody, uh, what is the point exactly? And uh, the artist needs the, the roar of the crowd or the, the affirmation, uh, just like everybody else, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, Michelle? I think for me, um, I'm used to being alone. I live alone. I, for many years before um, making art, I worked alone. And for me, actually being in my studio, even though it's a private studio, there are other artists in their own private studios. Um, and there's, there's collective energy that we are all bringing into that building. And so similar to David, I don't feel alone when I'm working. In fact, when I'm out at my studio, um, and especially during this time of social distancing, um, I feel less alone. I feel more, more connected with other people than I do um, at most other times during the day. Yeah, I would, I would say that I feel more alone when I'm not working often than when I am working. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very insightful. Carrie Ann? Yeah, the alone time in my studio space is kind of like my happy space. So, you know, it doesn't feel alone. It's like you're juggling all these things in your, in your everyday life. And now with my new full-time job as a third grade school teacher <laughs> with, with, uh, with homeschooling, it's like, you know, when I can escape and work in that studio, it's, it's just, you can just let your mind kind of go. So for me, it's actually a really positive release that alone time. It should be for everyone, right? But artists create during their alone time. Um, and Simona? Uh, for me, <clears throat> so I always thought I was mostly extrovert and of course friends know you better than you do and my friends pointed out that I'm actually more of an introvert um, and it's and it's true and I actually just like everybody else here I feel I feel alone when I'm around people and I feel perfectly self-sufficient when I'm by myself so drawing time is you know my favorite my favorite time you know it's when um, I put on a podcast or listen to an audiobook um, Sorry, my dogs just came in home. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's my favorite time. It's, you know, you, you draw and you lose yourself and you, it's so nice and meditative. And I think probably most of the reason why I'm a happy person is because I get to draw so much. Wow. I'm going to interrupt for a moment because we have some, a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A. <laughs> so um, one question is for you, Carrie Ann Plank. Did you say those shapes in the donated piece are a rendering of a single shape that forces that from different angles that focuses probably on different from different angles? Yes, she, Carrie Ann is. Yeah. <laughs> say more about how you decide what each piece would look like. Uh, well, you know, there's the kind of the math behind things, and then you know. I look at, at, at what's like aesthetically pleasing too. So I'm, you know, kind of, I do a lot with, with, you know, sketching things out in some parts that, you know, kind of mathematically work, um, but don't, you know, necessarily aesthetically work, get pitched. And then I kind of focus on, you know, the forms that are beautiful, you know, you can almost see them kind of like turn in and out when you look at them. Mm. I'm just going to jump in. If you if you have other questions, feel free to interrupt me, um, Robert or Nico. Um, uh, Simona talked about negative. Another question talked about negative space. Less is more. Can the other artists talk about how they decide to leave things out, omit, leave things, leave space, etc.? That's a juicy one. I don't leave much space. <laughs> yeah, I don't leave. I don't leave too much space either. Um, I, you know, everything's so much about like building layer upon layer upon layer. You know, printing ninety nine layers of transparent nothingness to add up to something, but. Um, you know, I guess when I think about that negative space kind of harkens back to what I was talking about earlier about working so subtractively about then going back and painting and deleting all of these things that you've built up. Yeah, printmaking is certainly a process, no matter how you do it, of layering, of adding, 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 seeing what you have, adding more and adding more. So it's kind of a reverse of <laughs> looking at negative space in a way. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Michelle. Michelle, 
living and studying Cuba, how has that informed your art? Well, it completely made me a printmaker. Um, mm -hmm. Prior to traveling to Cuba, I, um, I did drawing and painting. And after traveling to Cuba for a couple of years, I connected with a group of printmakers there and just said in, at that time, my very worst Spanish possible um, that I wanted to come back and study printmaking at the Sociedad Gráfica de Cienfuegos. Mm -hmm. and, and they just um, said, yeah, come. So I've been going back um, until this year, at least once or twice a year and studying printmaking. And so that has, um, with a little bit of additional instruction here in the United States, um, practically completely all of my printmaking instruction has been in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 100% influenced by um, Cuban instruction and Cuban methods, which are very, very manual. Um, there's not a lot of high tech equipment there. Um, we, when we're there, we clean up our hands and brushes with gasoline and um, vegetable oil is, is, a, is a precious commodity there that people use for cooking. You don't clean your rollers or your, your brushes with vegetable oil. So it's, um, it's a very, it influences my printmaking 100%. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the significance of your imagery in your work? Um, well, as a figure, figurative artist, um, my figures are created from an internal reaction to a posed model. And then um, when, I, when I paint or print make, that's when more of a narrative component will will be introduced into the figure. Um, they're very personal. It comes from a very personal space, but I think overall the, the personal component of it um, doesn't necessarily pass through to a viewer. I like for, I think it provides for them to have their own personal interpretation or connection um, to the work. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you know, art and um, and design are there. It, it's global <coughs> global industry, right? And and everyone uh, is connected. And and Simona, uh, you grew up in Bulgaria. You studied in Spain, and um, kind of what is I'm I'm a immigrant, and what is that like to be uh, all of a sudden finding yourself in America in America 2020? Um, as, as an artist and, and kind of being, are you an American artist? Are you, are you, are you Bulgarian? Like, who are you? Does that raise uh, questions uh, in you kind of the heritage that you, that you have and you put it in the now because there's all these layers. Um, Simona, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think there's so many things that inform who we are and what our art looks like. And one of them is where you grew up in your culture. There's so many more, your people, um, your friends, you know, who taught you what kind of books you were into. But culture and, you know, where I'm from definitely, um, you know, definitely played a part in, you know, building my personality, which also builds my work. Um, it, being an artist here has, you know, nothing is, I think it's black or white. It has its uh, positives and negatives. So my green card got suspended thanks oh. to our lovely president. Oh, but I'm reapplying now. So hopefully second time charm. Um, but also here I have been uh, financially way more more comfortable than I have been in London or Barcelona or Bulgaria. And I would say that especially in a place where, you know, San Francisco arts are very highly appreciated and same for New York and London. Um, there is so much more over, you know, cherishing and respect towards the arts than, um, you know, like Bulgaria is still economically probably not as well. So things like, uh, you know, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer are way more um, respected and looked, looked up to. Yeah, it's a, I mean, I, you know, I can 
there's books written about what it means to be from different cultures and um, so many people, you know, it's hard to answer it in just a few sentences, but I would say this would be my summary. Anyone else want to respond to that? And, and it can also just be your cultural heritage, right? It doesn't mean that you uh, bring something, we all bring a very unique perspective. Um, I guess uh, the only thing I could say about that, having been born and uh, grown up in this country is um, in the last uh, year or two, it almost seems like a foreign country. And I realize this is probably a component of age as well as anything else. Everything that I've been used to is quite different in the last couple of years. And um, certainly that's affected my artwork, uh, uh, made it much more political than uh, directly political than it was before. Uh, so. Speaking of your artwork, David, I'm just gonna jump in with one of the questions about mm -hmm. your, your characters. It looks like, um, well, one question was about how did you obtain your knowledge of art history, particularly in, in your area of focus? Was there a specific inspiration? you know, for you early in your career? Like, how did you sort of land on this? Um... Oh, that has been just a, a kind of a slow development. I do not have academic training in an art school. Uh, it's something I picked up and fell in love with. And over the course of my life, squeezed more and more room to do it, <laughs> to finally I could do it full time. Uh, and I would say, in tandem with artistic influences are, are there's a lot of literary influences. Uh, uh, you know, things like uh, Rabelais' Gargantua and uh, uh, all the way up to like Alfred Jarry and his, his uh, pataphysical uh, point of view. And uh, it's just a stew, just stuff goes in and it percolates and then it starts to come out. And, there is another question for you, um, which is like, do some of your characters or creatures in, in, you know, where do they come from, which I think you might have just spoke to, but maybe you could say, expand upon that a little and, and do they show up in pieces of, you know, do they repeat themselves? Uh, well, I think uh, one thing is, is more recently, I try not to do that. It seems like each piece is almost it's like a novel, it's not a short story. By the time with, I'm done with it, that's it. I don't need to do it again. But uh, recently I came back to Bosch a little bit because uh, he came from a time where there was a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, moral posturing <laughs> at the time. And, and that, that is the gist of a lot of his work, even though I think what's amazing is the creativity which with he portrayed uh, some of these things. Um, and I think we're at a time like that again, where uh, you have to take a moral standpoint. And I find some of his, his uh, what, grotesqueries uh, to be, to inspire some of my things. Uh, uh, they're very interesting. And, uh, they uh, draw you in and make you think about what's going on. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question or not. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Um, maybe not a question. Um, it's 2020. Next year, it will be 2021. Anyone, any ideas for any super inspired big projects um, for 2021? Because we have to move forward, right? Wow. <laughs> I can't say that I do at this point. I think I'm still waiting, um, waiting to see. Uh, the current work I am uh, working on right now, because I started looking at Holbein's Dance of Death again, and I figured I should be up to the challenge for that as I'm uh, doing a piece called Death in the Printmaker. So we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> I think for me this time, um, I don't have any 
big projects that I'm working on. I'm, I'm more of a contemplative, reflective, um, takes, takes a while for things to incubate within me for the next um, big project. Um, for now though, I've mainly been working on things that, that feel, or initially I wanted to feel lighter or more playful or more joyful. Um, I didn't want to feel a pressure of what's my next big project going to be. I just want to, I, I just want to work through this time as best as I can. However, I do know that while all of this is happening, there's a lot going on inside of me and I'm, I am excited for 2021 to get here. So all that's happening inside will one day um, in my studio start to reveal itself um, to me and I'm looking forward to that time. Thank you. I want to just jump in for a moment and say you uh, should be could be bidding on these art pieces right now in the silent auction. Uh, I don't know if you are or not. I've tried to look and it's too distracting, but um, uh, it, this and also their websites like on the Alliance Health Project website, each artist has their own website listed. So please do um, visit them, visit their studios, get, you know, get um, you can have many artists are doing virtual studios. Are any of you doing virtual studio or, or in-person studio visits at this point? Okay. Yes, yes, yes and no. I take private studio appointments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, we were hoping, we were thinking this was gonna go for um, 30 minutes, but we're at 45. So I just wanted to, um, you know, be respectful of everyone's time. And um, and also there's still, of course, a lot of questions coming in. Uh, maybe we'll just take a couple more questions and then we'll sign off. Nico, yeah? Yeah. Okay. I love the questions from, from the 43 people we cannot see. I know, it's kind of cool. We were up to 45 and now people are dropping off. So I do wanna, um, I think that part of it is, you know, it's dinner time. Um, yeah. But one question, what David, uh, and there's a couple questions, one for David, one for a couple for Michelle. Are the, Michelle, are the puzzle pieces that you use to make your art also for sale? And that question made me think about Carrie Ann Plank who will sometimes make prints and then sell these gorgeous wood blocks. So this is maybe for both of you. Well, for me, absolutely, you know, ev everything's for sale. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to um, offer up as well the piece that I've donated to Art for AIDS. I do have that puzzle. So if we can get, you know, a really strong bid on that, on that piece, if we can get up to um, the what I don't know, whatever the buy it now, yeah, the, buy it now or above, buy it now or above, and I will throw in the puzzle. Um, I will throw in the, the wooden puzzle, so fantastic. Um, and also, a lot of the artists have videos, so if you also go to the little Alliance Health Project, um site you can watch the artist videos uh that's that's kind of fun too and michelle i know you made a, a really interesting video about that piece um yeah um and then david there's another one for you uh mm, oh no this is for everyone during covid how have you coped with not being around people that spark or mentor your art process yeah it's it's uh it's uh you miss it that's all i can say you know yeah there's just the interaction the the you know and, and even if it was people who i didn't see that often i'm seeing them even less often now <laughs> so yeah 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 things just have to kind of adapt and 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 change like i you know i have a a group of artists that we have a zoom meeting every week and we just talk about what's happening in the studio and what's happening in the art world and you know try to connect that way uh, 
Any other closing remarks? I do have, uh, uh, we just learned there's a bid on Michelle's piece that just happened. So that came in in the, in the Q&A. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, oh, and we also have one of the board members said, thank you so much. She's so, she wrote that she is so proud of you and so thankful for all of you for your generosity and contributions year after year and certainly this year. Um, and a, a bunch of other people are saying thank you. So I wanna just say that um, of course bidding is open and it will be open until Saturday night. We're having our talks each night this week, not Friday, but tomorrow, you know, we're, we're doing the traditional section. So tomorrow's photography, then mixed media and sculpture, and then paintings on Thursday. And then Saturday at 7 p.m. is our live auction show. And I hope you uh, all come to that. And you might want to make sure you sign in early because there is an opening sequence that you won't want to miss by our director and some other characters in the community. Um, so do come to that and- um, It's DK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And um, we're going to show a little video on the way out that's a promo for the live auction. And um, just thank you so much um, for this kickoff. It's, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all. The nuances in my work is in relationship of form and it's about San Francisco and change and the layers that are in all the buildings that give us the narratives of the city. I always seem to find myself in coming of age series. It's about being between two states and that moment where you're sort of neither here nor there. I love to kind of bring in that it's sort of spontaneity at the same time as deliberate. But there's just something so life-affirming about it. Um, so that's really why I do it. 